Welcome to the Agile Wire. Brought to you by Wisconsin Agility. We want you to get agile and stay agile. Now here are your hosts, Jeff Bubbles and Chad Beyer. And we're recording. All right, kick us off, Jeff. All right, we have David Padeda uh, joining us today on the podcast. And David just finished a book called On Trapping Product Teams. David, you got a one thing that's just like, I'm like, this is going to catch people's attention right here. And you have this phrase and you use it often in the book about bullshit management. So I think we all have ideas of what that might be. But what do you mean when you say bullshit management? What I mean, it's an art. It's an art of doing things that create no value, but drain all of your energy. And there's an equation behind it. It's a very simple one. The more bullshit you handle, the less value you create. That's what I meant. So can you give me some examples of what bullshit would be? Sure. Uh, there's a classic example, which I call as managing the backlog for the sake of it. So you realize that you have an extensive backlog full of everything. Mm. But when you look at that, you have no idea where you're going, but then you keep loading your backlog and you lose track of what you were doing. You realize you're not a product manager anymore. You're a backlog manager. So what's okay. So this is good. So like, let's dive into this detail and then we'll, we'll come back out. Um, so pro, backlog length, like, what do you think? Like rule of thumb, I know it's everything is in context and it's different, but like, What's a good rule of thumb for a product backlog length? So that's a, that's an interesting question. And generally I say it should be small enough that you have room to learn. For example, if your backlog pressures you to deliver, then it means that you are going to focus on the promise you had. And then you are not going to look in front of you and try to learn. I say it's kind of a driving forward, looking backward. So you're going to crash mm -hmm. your car. So for me, a good backlog length would have somewhere like enough for the upcoming two sprints. So you still have something to learn and adapt. But if you look at your backlog and you say, if you are to do everything that is here, it would take us six months. Oh, there's something going on here. There's something going on. Yeah. So when Chad and I coach teams, uh, we always like to like have more of an emergent backlog. And we, and I think the rule of thumb that we normally give them is like one to three sprints that's ready to be pulled into a sprint if you're doing scrum. And then there should be big, vague items that are kind of down your list. But like, if you could keep it under 50, that's a pretty good number. Like, then you can be like, nope, this is a big thing that outcome. We're not going to do that right now. Like, kill that thing. We're working on this thing. It's the next most important problem. And if you haven't broken it down into detailed items, like it, uh, you have less some cost fallacy of like getting rid of it on your backlog because you haven't done mm -hmm. that, that requirements gathering or like got into the details of it. What are your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, uh, my feeling is the same. I, I, I like the idea of a one, two, three, three, 50 items. Generally, that's what is there. I call one technique of extreme backlog cleaning. So you need to keep your backlog tidy and beautiful and ensure that it's delivering value. And the cost policy is something, the more invested you are, the more you want to invest and so on. And what I like saying and keeping in my mind is that backlog items, the age, like milk, not wine. The older they get, actually, the less relevant they are. You said one word that I love, context. So creating digital products is related to the context. If we mm -hmm. are bringing something to the market, it's continuously changing. Our product, the landscape, the customers. So whenever we have something, we need to look at the context we have right now and see how relevant that is. So let's say if we haven't talked about something in the last three months, I think it's good to go. I'll throw out another maybe controversial statement out there. I think hierarchical backlogs are bullshit. That's bullshit management right there. So if you have Epic's features and product backlog items all tied together and you're keeping that relationship, that's bullshit project management, bullshit management, product management, whatever you want to say. Yep. I agree. And many people ask me, like, how do you structure your product backlog? And, you know, I like seeing, like, we used to do things more complicated than we should because in the past, when user stores came to exist, what was the idea of that? The idea was to have a car that you pick the car and you go talk to the user. Uh, and if it doesn't make sense, you just throw the card away. But it was to keep it simple, right? Mm -hmm. And now we have all of these crazy workflows and so on. I'm not going to blame Jira. Jira enables you to do that. 
but the driver decides how to do it. So I say, maybe if you want to start being agile, just trash your backlog and start creating something on Miro and make it simple. Because in Miro, mm -hmm. there's only something you can do because it will get messy, then you cannot handle. Then you are forced to organize. Love that. Yeah, this is, I. it's great. I. In the book, you have like sort of a top 10 list for bullshit management. And um, when I when I review that, I realize these are all the things I've been fighting for like decades. In like wherever you put me in an organization, I tend to just get frustrated by like the wasteful things, right? Like, why are we doing this? And everyone, not everyone, but most, a lot of people just, they don't question it. And they're just like, that's just the way it is around here. And it's like, no, it doesn't have to be. Um, so I don't know. I think the top 10 list is very interesting, but so much of it is just just wasteful activities, right? Almost that lean thinking approach, like they're non-value add things. Um, and, and unfortunately, when the management in the organization is focused on that, when collect, you know, when we're all focused on those things, we're just wasting our time, right? We're wasting all the time we could be focused on value add activities. It is totally true. And one of the reasons I decided to use the name bullshit management is because it scares people. And no yep. one wants to do bullshit management. And that enables a conversation. I know it's a strong term, but it doesn't matter. It is about m moving away from our status quo. And that's why I have there the bullshit management check and say, hey, let's look at what is happening. The only thing I try to do, let's step back from our busy routine because everyone has a busy routine. And let's look at things that are happening. And then we can have a conversation. How does this kind of thing help us create value for the business and customer? And if we cannot answer that, there's a big chance we are doing bullshit management. So mm -hmm. let's kick that out of our way and focus on the things that truly matter. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, <clears throat> Jeff and I just got done teaching a, an advanced scrum master class and it, I think it'd be great to show your top 10 list of bullshit management to scrum masters, right? Because, I mean, it, sometimes it can be overwhelming, right? A scrum master, essentially, if you're really going to make a big impact in an organization, you're a change agent at, at the end of the day. Like, you can do the team level stuff, but eventually, if you want to really mature and make a big impact, you're a change agent. And there's your top 10 list to work on. Like, I mean... Most scrum masters, those big organizational impediments that they run into eventually, it's right on your top 10 list of bullshit management. So they like, there it is. You have all the things you should be watching out for, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a very, it's fascinating. It's like most things in our, our realm, nothing is brand new, right? Almost everything is derivative. Like eh, this kind of sounds like lean thinking that waste, but what I love about it is you did put that spin on it. It's sort of that attention grabber, right? Like it's yeah. hard to ignore when you have that phrase. Cause it's a, it's a, it's a jarring phrase. <laughs> it is true. And uh, what I wrote there, it is nothing new. It's just what is happening. But there's one thing I have been doing all of that. And I thought it was right. I was gathering requirements and doing everything stakeholders wanted just to learn that it had nothing to do what customers needed. And I was still doing that. I even got it promoted. I was also in a meeting marathon. I was maximizing the amount of yes I said. I was doing all of that because I was ill equipped for the job. But what happened throughout my life, I saw in different places, startups, big corporations, public sector, and different sectors from Brazil to Germany, consulting different companies in the US, Australia, and so on. This happens all over the place. And I was not the only one making these mistakes. I thought, what if I just put the list here and I share stories? That's what I try to convey. And then people can decide. And whenever they take the list, as you said, the driving agent, because it's all about driving change here. So that's what we want to achieve, right? Pick one item of the list and say, this is the first thing we want to, uh, to change. Because if you try changing everything at once, it's very hard. So just pick mm -hmm. one of them and say, let's try this one first here. Then you start seeing the benefit and then boom, you start doing more of product management and less of bullshit management and life gets fun again. Yeah. So if it was you, where would you start uh, on this list? Like you walk into an organization, you're a product manager and all this stuff's happening. 
but you got to start somewhere. Where do you start? It depends a lot on the context, I would say. But my gut feeling today in the scenario we are hybrid work and so on, I would attack directly the meeting marathon. Because when I look at calendar of people, I get scared. They have no time to work because they are busy with meetings. Problem is they are busy with meetings that you could solve with a message on Slack or your communicator, maybe an email, or maybe you could just call someone spontaneously as you would do in the office. So I would attack the meeting marathon because I think mm -hmm. this is stealing time from people and not only time, energy, because you, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I realized, I was reflecting when I moved here to Germany, I worked in a, in a building, nine floors, and we had one meeting room per floor. Each meeting room had a space of eight people. So it was a struggle, nine floors, one meeting room per floor. We had to be very mindful of when we would have the meeting because we couldn't get the room all the time and who we would invite. What is happening right now? How many meeting rooms do you have? How many seats do you have? So you guess what happened, right? More meetings with more people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one because you have com complete control over that as an individual. Like, I'm just not going to go to these meetings or I'm going to send an email here and set a schedule this meeting. And you can kind of be that change you want to see in the world. Right. So I, I do. I like that. I like that approach. Um, I don't know. I really like your collaborative development flow, like as a co idea. And um, I think aligning around something that delivers value. It's kind of like if you're on a team and you're like, I want to be happy on a team. Well, I think you're a lot of times you're happy if you're successful. And if you're successful, what are you doing? You're delivering and you're delivering yes. value. And so get to that point first. And then all this other stuff can start fading away because it's just not needed anymore if you're delivering value. So I think that's a it's a bigger, harder thing to focus on. Um, but I think it, I don't know, exponential value return for the organization if you can do that. It is. And uh, as you said, what I try first is where is the place it depends only on me, then I can start acting. So some people tell me, I'm not allowed to do this thing you're saying here. I cannot do product discovery. Nobody's supporting me. So I cannot do it. I say, yes, you can become the victim of the circumstance if you want. You just say, I cannot do it. Or you can be the hero of your story. You look at the cards you have and they say, what is the best move I can do right now? And then you act, talking about the collaborative role. Contrary to the coordinative flow that you are just coordinating tasks, in summary, you are talking about the work instead of doing the work. The collaborative flow, you are looking, what is happening right now? What should I do with this? And so on. If you are not empowered to do product discovery, you can ask one question. You receive a list of features and then you can say, what is success? How do we know we are doing the right thing? And you can also ask the question, what are we assuming to happening? Here. Then you may realize we are assuming that customers would pay for that. We're assuming they understand this. All of these kind of things you can test without asking for permission. And then you can show results to the others and say, hey, I realize that customers don't understand this design here. Should we still build something that nobody understands? You can mm -hmm. have this kind of questions. And it's showing intent to, uh, to help. You are not challenging expertise. You're saying, this is what I discovered. What should we do with this information? Oh. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that's great because in most organizations, it, you, it happens like you have in bullshit management here, as you describe. It's all about outputs and people says, I have the idea. I'm the stakeholder. I know. Here's my opinion. And you should build it this way. And the, and the way we build technology these days, like we can almost do anything like that's not the riskiest assumption. That's the easiest assumption. But we do the most expensive, easiest thing first. And we and we wait to do all those like assumptions like you just talked about, like. Can people use it? Will they buy it? How will they behave once they have this? Like we could test so many things without building. And I just, I don't know, maybe it, it's just teams just don't do that. It just doesn't happen enough. Yeah, because they feel unempowered and then they become the victim. Yeah. I like doing differently. If you look at my book here, a lot of people ask me the question, when are you going to write the book? So this is one evidence that people might be interested in what I have to say. But I said, it's not enough evidence for me to commit with the book. Mm -hmm. So I did gradual commitment escalation with the book to see if it was worth creating. The very first thing I posted on LinkedIn and I said, let's listen to the resonance and see. Then I interviewed people. 
Did you know? I had to test for first interest. So that's what I was assessing. And then there's another thing. There is feasibility and viability. The question is, can I write a book? I am a blogger. I can write blogs, which is a different game. And the other is, will people pay for that, actually? So you know what I did? Instead of writing the whole book, I put together something I had to say and I called as the product strategy guide. So I put on my newsletter, but instead of making that free, I said, I want to see those who are really interested. So I put that as a premium for my newsletter. In one week, I got a hundred people who decided to upgrade the newsletter to consume this. And then I decided to interview some of them and see what they got from that to see if my message came across the way I wanted. And then once I realized that it didn't, so I had something to fix. So I tested again with another guide and then it improved. So I kept improving and iterating. So once it started getting rounded, I said, now I can commit to write a book because I learned what I didn't know and I could correct my mistakes before publishing the book. Love That's it. amazing. <laughs> and and now the results for everybody out there, I don't know. We'll see when this goes out compared to what today is. You can't even get this book on Amazon right now. Like it's sold out because you did all the validation up front. If you haven't done that validation, it probably wouldn't be where it is today. So uh, I don't know. I think it's that's an amazing story of applying a product mindset to writing a book. Yeah, what a I've meta never... what a meta level story to tell, right? Like um sometimes people write things, they teach things, and then they don't actually practice what they preach. And it's very evident, right? You can see that. Um in this case, you just told the story about how you you used utilized exactly what you're talking about, what you're writing about, what you're sharing with the world. Um to bring this to life, which is, again, it's, it's great. Um, it works. I mean, and, and the thing is like most, most ideas we have, right. That we like a startup idea, some product idea, we all know most of them are going to fail. Like you have to check your ego at the door and realize this is like a casino. Like we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna keep playing and we're gonna win once in a while. Um, but there's better ways, right? There are better ways to give yourself a better chance uh, and cheaper ways, really. I mean, that's maybe that's the biggest thing, right? There's there's cheaper ways to experiment your way into the future um, instead of trying to do all this analysis up front based on assumptions and opinion. Yes, that's amazing. There are cheaper ways. And many people start with the details. And I say, just start doing. And once it hurts and you cannot do it anymore, you'll make it better. Going back to the book, I first interviewed and I started writing my newsletter. I said, now I'm going to form a group, which I called as the beta readers. There were five people that would be reading. So I put in Google Docs and then they would comment. And what happened is after some point, I couldn't catch up with the comments anymore. I didn't know what was exactly happening, but I was doing, I did two iterations with Google Docs, very hard to catch up with everything. Then that moment I said, I need a better tool. So I heard about the tool, which is help this book. So I put there the manuscript and then I could see better feedback. People would say, I love this part. This is useful to me. This I'm falling asleep. This is confusing. So I could see where the readers were engaging, where they were living. And I could see where they were bouncing, where I lost them. And then I did more iterations. In total, the book, I did six iterations. So really, you know, if you look at the, the, this agile classic thing, you start with the skateboard before you build the car yeah. and so on. So I did this kind of things here and so on. In total, I got more than 5,000 feedback. So when I sent to the publisher, I honestly, I was very scared because I did loads of work and many people told me, <laughs> It's a cancer, the publisher. Once they start working on your book, you are screwed up. You cannot get it out. And I was really afraid, really afraid of everything that could happen because I put a lot of energy and love to get this thing rounded in a way that my audience would understand. Because my audience that I focus were on people creating products. I focus on product managers, agile coaches, scrum masters, and software engineers. I wanted to see what they got from that. So the feedback was wrong. But once I sent to the publisher, they gave me a different feedback. I said, hey, your book is quite rounded already. There's not a lot for us to do. What we can do for you, as you are not a native English speaker, we can do flow editing. We can make it better and more consistent, but we don't want to change our structure. 
We don't want to give feedback on content quality. We just want to ensure that it's rounded and the sentences are at the best way possible. And that's what they help me with a, a little bit of a structuring some of the sentence and so on. And it went smooth. So all the fear I had was related to people who didn't do this kind of book yeah. creation, you know, because for me it was a book is a product. So I should tr treat this guy as a product. Yep. So that's what I did. I love it. You know, it's so funny. So Jeff and I, we read quite a few books. We haven't written one. It's on our, it's on our back. It's on the, the low part of our backlog at some point. Right. But, um, but in our network, we have a lot of people who have written books. Right. And there's some pattern that Jeff and I have noticed over the years, and I'll just use the 80, 20 rule. Um, it feels to, to us like 80% of the books we read, there's that core of it. It starts out strong. It gets to the core part of it. And then the, the, the last third, last 25 to, to 33% of the book feels like they took it to the publisher. They didn't actually have like the word limit hit. And they're like, you have to fill, like it feels like filler just to hit, uh, just to hit some limit. And I, I, again, I see this pattern in so many books and like, by the end, I'm just like, ah, oh, like I, I power through and I read it. It's almost like a Netflix series where the first three seasons are great. And then fourth <sighs> and fifth, the plot gets weird. It drops off and you're like, I almost feel like I, that wasn't worth my time to finish that, you know? So I think it's very interesting that you took it to the publisher and they're like, this feels very well-rounded already. Um, you're in that 20% of the 80-20 rule, I feel like, right? And again, like one book example, I'll just throw out because it, it was big and impactful for me. Um, uh, Stephen Denning, right? Wrote The Age of Agile. He also wrote um, um, the one before that. I'm blanking now. but And then also Gary Hamill. I'm a big fan of Gary Hamill's books. And he wrote The Future of Management and, um, and then one of his more recent ones. But those authors, whenever I get to the end of their books... I feel this crescendo, like everything's building, building, building. And I can't like, I can't stop turning the pages. And, but again, that, that's rare for me, I think when we're reading books in our, our uh, industry. So I, I just think that's fascinating that I think you did that hard work of validation so that when you got to that, that point, you were expecting the publisher to come in and say, oh, we have to redo this. But they were probably like, wow. <laughs> um, it was very different to yeah. me, very uh, unexpected, because you talk, uh, talked about the word limit. My first ver version had 85,000 words, and then I got so much feedback of redundance, things that were not rounded. I trim it down. Yep. The book ended with uh, 70,000 words, so we had to trim down. And uh, you know, one of the tips I always give people. If you want to grow, you need to find a mentor. And a mentor is someone who did something you want to do recently. So I thought about it. I said, I'm writing a book. Who is someone who has just published a book? And there's Martin Dauman, who mm -hmm. is Dutch, and he had reviewed some of my articles. Said, hey, I need you, man. You need to help me with this. And one of the tips he gave to me said, the end of the book doesn't get that much of love. So when you are reviewing your book, Keep it closed for a while and read it backwards. And then you are going to see that the end probably missed the mark. Then you fix it. Start from there. So I did three readings backward. So I said, nah, this message is not rounded. This, this is not good. So I tried to, to give a strong push in the end. Many people told me one of the best part of the book for them is the wrap up. Hmm. So that's what I got as a feedback. So I tried to do this and so on and to ensure that I would not lose readers in the end. And I kept some of the things to the end that are quite powerful to me and I hope to be powerful to the other, like product principles. So that is chapter 12. So I left that to the end because I wanted to keep the, the readers gaining loads of value in all chapters and, and so on. So finding the balance. It is hard, but once you find a mentor, someone who just did what you want to do, it helps a lot. Yeah. That's great advice. This has been a great conversation. We've dived into bullshit management and <laughs> some different techniques inside of there. And you know, we couldn't get through the whole top 10 list, but that's why you got to read the book. So um, 
Everybody who's listening to this should go read the book because it's a really great book. And it's just patterns we see everywhere. Um, so I guess at this point, David, is there anything else you wanted to plug or promote to our listeners? Well, what I would tell the listeners is whatever you are, it's not perfect. And it will never be. And the thing is, you can make peace, however it is, but you accept, or you can drive some change. And one of the things that I learned in my life is don't lecture people, help them see what you see, figure out how you can make that possible, make it tangible to them. One way is touching the most sensitive organ in the human being. It's called pocket. So if you figure out how to show something that is going to have an impact on the pocket, financial impact, people are going to listen to you. So an example, create a feature report. How are these features that were created over the last 12 months used? You won't be surprised if that is shocking that 50% is not used at all. The moment you show that to somebody, you can have a conversation and then you can start driving some change. But in short, help the other see what you see. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, David. Um, we'll leave the link to the book, Untrapping Product Teams, in the show notes. And um, thanks for your time today. This was, this was a blast. Thanks a lot for having me here. It was a pleasure. If you found value in today's episode, share this with a friend. Until next time, get agile and stay agile.